Because the problem started a whole lot earlier. Okay. You want to go through the history of this? So, you remember Great Depression, 1933, one of the solutions was to say we're going to separate ordinary, boring banking, checking account, savings accounts from all the other kinds, investments, the high risk. You can do both of those, you just can't do them in the same institution. Okay, fine, so built a big wall between the two. But let's face it, the banks wanted access to the high profits you get from doing that trading, and the traders wanted access to those deposits. So they kept hammering on Washington to change it, and the regulators started changing it in the 1980s. And they started creating loopholes in the old Glass-Steagall Act. So that finally, in 1999, Congress got rid of the whole thing. But it was a shell by then. And so what happened? We have the big crash in 2008. What does everyone, including folks on Squat Box, say about it? They say too much concentration in financial services creates too big to fail, puts us at bigger risk. And what's happened since 2008? The four biggest financial institutions are now 30% bigger than they but, were but, but in Senator, 2008. We're talking, so this is all apples and oranges, though. Every one of the banks, the ones that were involved, Bear Stearns, Lehman, Merrill Lynch, Countrywide, WAMU, IndyMac, AIG, none of those are the companies that you're talking about here. And in fact, the companies that you're talking about are the ones that were able to help absorb the problems that we had. Oh. And the Bank of America, and what would we have done if Bank of America didn't absorb Countrywide and Merrill? If J.P. Morgan hadn't absorbed Bear Stearns uh, and WAMU, if Wells Fargo hadn't helped us with with Wachovia we'd be worse off so let's just unpack that just a little bit okay and look at the pieces we've got here remember that what this is about is whether or not the people who want to do the big trading should be able to get access to deposits right and that's part of what drove TARP and what drove our bailout was the fact that we had the depository institutions were also at risk. But that was Remember, from their normal lending. A lot of that was from just the, you know, the, the, the subprime bubble and the housing oh, bubble I'm sorry. and commercial loans. Oh, and I'm sorry. Yes, it was about their mortgages, but it was also about the kinds of instruments they were trading in. Which were packaged by the, which were packaged by the non-financial loaded, holding. And but, how they loaded up on risk. But, but, but at the end... At the end of the day, there is no single magic bullet that's going to stop too big to fail. That's part of what right. we've learned. There's a lot that's going on there. But the central premise behind a 21st century Glass-Steagall is to say, if you want to get out there and take risks, go and do it. But what you can't do is you can't get access to FDIC-insured deposits when you do. That by itself, a little bit, helps bring down the size of some of the financial institutions, and it says at least one portion of our banking sector stays safer. And I think that is a good thing. It moves us in the right direction. Doesn't fix everything by itself, doesn't pretend to fix everything by itself, but it moves us in the right direction. And that's what we want. Senator, I'm going to just jump in here and, uh, sure. and, and ask you what you would say to some of the criticisms of your proposed bill here. For example, we were speaking to Chris Whalen earlier on today from uh, Carrington Investment Services, and he was saying it would be hugely disruptive to impose this new Glass-Steagall. And one of the things that he says could be a result is it would really hurt credit creation, which obviously in turn would hurt the economy. What would you say, for example, to that? You know, that was pretty much what the banks were saying back in 1932 and 1933. They kept saying no, no, no to Glass-Steagall. They raised all kinds of objections to it. And they kept hammering away at it because they wanted to be able to get access to those deposits in order to fuel more speculative trading. And what this says is no. We can't do that. If you're going to have FDIC insurance, you're going to have savings accounts and checking accounts. They really do have to be walled off. Remember, we had 50 years following the passage of Glass-Steagall in which we had a tiny number of bank failures. That whole boom and bust cycle from 1797 to 1933 went away. And in that period of time, we built a strong, robust middle class. What happened is we started chipping away, and part of the chipping away at that 
was to say, load up the banks with more and more risk, get them more integrated, and let them get bigger and bigger. So, so, and when that happened, we were in the position of having to bail them out when Sen they got into big financial trouble. Senator, I, I will push back, though, on the relative security that you're portraying Glass-Steagall to have given us, because Continental Illinois, yeah. in the early 80s, was the, the 80s. seventh largest bank in America. It yes. failed, almost mm -hmm. set off basically a, another major banking crisis. Shouldn't we just tell the American consumer that no matter what we do, there will be bank boom and bust cycles, no matter what the laws and regulations? You can't protect everything. No, that is just wrong. Why? Look at the history. From I, I have looked at history. We were filled with booms and busts from, from the Dutch no, no, tulip no. crisis to now. From 1797 to 1933, the American banking system crashed about every 15 years. In 1933, we put good reforms in place for which Glass-Steagall was the centerpiece. And from 1933 to the early 1980s, that's a 50-year period, we didn't have any of that. None. We kept the system steady but and secure, that, that, you, and it was only as we started deregulating, you start hitting the SNL crisis, and what did we do? We deregulated some more, and then you hit long-term capital management at the end of the 90s, and what did we do as a country? This country continued to deregulate more, and then we hit the big crash in 2008. You are not going to defend the proposition that regulation can never work. It I, I, did, did I didn't work. say regulation ever worked, Senator, by, by far and away. And I agree, there were fewer bank failures in that time after Glass-Steagall. Fewer complete... as in, of the big ones, no. zero. But, but, Continental but, Illinois was the seventh biggest bank in the United States. It, 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 it took it failed. 50 years to get there. But, Senator, you're on the we record, you're on the record saying Glass-Steagall Glass would not have prevented the financial crisis. Not you're... all by itself. That's absolutely right. But what Glass-Steagall can do is it can wind some more of the risk out of the system. It can help bring down the size of the largest banking institutions. Don't forget, you said there was too much concentration in the banking industry in 2008. Now here we are in 2013 and the big four are 30 percent bigger. That puts too much risk back in the system. Well, there's other ways of, uh, there's other ways of, of shrinking them, um, obviously. But... With, with all due respect, Senator, every report I've read, every person I've spoken to says that there's a very, very, very slim chance of this, of this even passing. Well, let me put it this way. If you don't fight for it, the chances are zero. And remember who my partners are in this one. I've got John McCain standing with me. I couldn't ask for a better fighter. We've got Maria Cantwell. We've got Angus King. We've got a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent. All people who are but, willing but, to get but, out Senator, there and you, you fight. know what the prospects are. The House has voted 37 times to... Um, you know, on, on Obamacare to, to yeah. defund it. And uh, it, I mean, is this any different? I mean, you're making a statement, but, but we want Congress to do things that actually have a chance of, of, of happening and, and become law. This seems like more of the actually, same. Go ahead. No, no, but I was just going to say, you know, I remember going on television multiple times, including here, when I talked about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, when the big banks were spending more than a million dollars a day lobbying against it, and when everybody told me, you'll never get that thing through. Why are you even trying? The chances of passing it are slim to none. And yet, look around. We now have a good, strong Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It's recovered a half a billion dollars for families who got cheated. It's out there working on behalf of military families, on behalf of seniors, on behalf of students. We got that agency because we got out and fight, fought for it. I actually believe in that. All right, uh, Senator, for some reason, we've got to leave again. You, uh, your passion has not changed. Uh, nope. You know, like seeing it. Um, You've grown into the job, so you're looking great. And, and, uh, and, 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 and we, I mean, in a intellectual, smart way. Yeah, 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 yeah. In a senatorial way. In a senatorial way. Yeah, you're looking yeah. great. Okay. Maybe less professorial, which was. Uh, well, that's, that's a compliment. Yeah, 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 yeah. No one wants to look but professorial. Still some, but still some. Just the right amount of both. Anyway, I'm getting out of here. Thank you, uh, <laughs> yeah. Senator Warren. You, you dug yourself into I a know, big I hole. Know.